We're getting close to the end of the specialization, and so in this video what I wanted to do is put it all together. Here's an example uh, from the website Zipcar, which on the whole has really great design. But I wanted to focus on a couple of data-driven interface errors that we see uh, in this site. So what they've done, which I on the whole like, is that the color palette is restricted, which gives it this very calm feel. The rub is that in this site, orange is overloaded. If you're going to have a color palette where colors are more than just decorative, an individual color should serve one purpose alone. For example, in many user interface widget libraries, there might be a couple of shades of gray and then a couple of shades of a particular color, blue or something like that. And often, the gray stuff means non-interactive and the blue stuff means interactive. So which things on this screen can you click on? I'll point out the orange elements here. You've got the two triangles for being able to select a location and a car type. Uh, up top, there's a banner about a uh, new service that's available. Uh, in the center right, we have a button for reserve. And then in the time slider widget, there's a piece that is orange, the rest is gray. And there's some text that is describing uh, presumably that orange piece. Oh, and then over here we have a, a Find Cars button. And if we wanted to be diligent, there's a few, a few bits of text scattered throughout the site that are also orange. So what does orange mean? Well, in many cases, orange is the stuff that you get to click on. So Find Cars, that button, that's orange. The drop-down menu, that's orange. The other drop-down menu, also orange. The calendar widgets, those are orange. OK, so orange means interactive, right? Um, well, here's a link. Uh, that could be orange. Sure, why not? I'm not exactly sure why it's in the same category as the other orange things, but, but not too bad so far. And the text over here, similarly. Uh, yep, find cars by location. That's orange. That's good. This element, um, that you can't click on. But, but that's OK. You got these sliders here, and they're pretty easy to see. Now, one thing that you may not realize is there's a gray chunk here and an orange chunk here. I've got an alert that says uh, your reservation overlaps another uh, uh, reservation. Normally, when something grayed out, that means it's unavailable. That's what I thought when I first saw this site. Turns out, actually, that uh, the grayed out is the part that's just fine. And orange is used to represent not the part that's good to go, but the part that is unavailable. Not a reasonable and unreasonable choice for orange. Uh, it just happens to be inconsistent with the usage of orange elsewhere on this page. If orange starts to mean things you may be interested in, these are the exciting parts, these are the interactive parts, then this button probably should be gray as opposed to orange when it's unavailable. Uh, university websites are always a little bit of a cheap shot. They have to do so many things with so few resources. Uh, but they provide such good examples that, that it's fun to show them. So this is, a, an, in, this is a web page that will let you look up the class list for a particular class. And the functionality that's exposed by this web page is actually great. Uh, you can do so in a variety of different ways. There's two challenges to this web page. The first one is that um, there are several different ways of selecting. And they're all um, one on top of the other. And so this gives us a page where the first path is a couple of screens worth here. And the second path is a couple of screens worth here. And then I think there might even be a third path. And there's a Go button after each of these. It makes for a page that's extremely long. And because many of the same fields are showing up over and over again, it often can be confusing to know which one you're in. This is a case where it might be better, as opposed to putting these things one on top of another serially, uh, you might be better off, for example, having three different tabs. So you could have a tab for type A, and a tab for type B, and a tab for type C. And that way, what a tab does is it enforces that you can't see parameters or set parameters that aren't relevant to your current task. Because in the serial case, you might set a parameter here and think it applies to this button when, in fact, it doesn't. 
The tab strategy means that you can't set those parameters. They're not visible. It's, it's modal in that sense. The second thing that I wanted to point out is we started with some good examples. We've got our, our Blue Apron and our Eater that do a great job of filling the space well, leaving enough room to breathe, and taking what on the back end is a lot of data and presenting it in a relaxed, streamlined way. Here, there's a lot of white space, but it's not in very useful ways. And what hasn't been done with this page is there's no sense of scale that's differentiating things. So for example, imagine if we let Eater or Blue Apron redesign this site, you would get you know, a much bigger button for term. And some of the other key salient variables would pop out and become big, maybe bold, maybe colored. And then you might have drop down menus for some of these other things. I wanted to show this one second because it really conveys how the sense of scale that's used so effectively in our good sites, uh, you might not notice its absence at first or how much power it's giving to success here. But now that you look at these right one right after the other, you can see there's a big difference. Similarly, this is from the Clipper Transit Card site. In this case, there are several parameters you need to set for being able to get a new card. There's two aspects that impede usability here. The first one is the use of color, that we have a site here where no matter how wide your browser window is, uh, they've chosen to make a background that goes all the way across. There are times when that can work, but in general, I think this strategy is not so great. You know, if you have a, a guaranteed limit here, this can be reasonable. But these long bars draw a lot of visual attention, even subconsciously, uh, away from the thing that you're actually trying to attend to. We almost want to sublimate, in this case, these header categories and let the content underneath those header categories come to the fore. Now you'll see there's a are you sure you want to proceed section here where the text is all in red. Usually when text is in red, it means that something bad is happening. But in this case, this is par for the course. It's the only way to get a card. Um, so there's neither something particularly careful that you need to pay attention to or not something bad or, or unreasonable that's happening. This is just the normal chain of events. And I, usually, it's wise to reserve red text for times where, where there's, there's something that's gone astray, for an error, for a warning. And lastly, uh, in part because of these giant banners, you know, uh, and in part just by lousy design, um, a lot of the but buttons and widgets are bumping up against other elements on the screen. Think about some of the more successful designs we've seen and how they take a similar kind of uh, category label element within the category strategy, but do so in a way that doesn't, doesn't bump and, and jangle in that, in that way. So now that you've seen me talk through a number of different designs and things that I, I would do to be able to redesign them more clearly, you're set to do the assignments for this course where you'll get a chance to do the same kind of redesign activity.